my name is George Williams. I'm the Dean of UNSW Law, and I'd like to begin today's proceedings by acknowledging the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which this law school is located. And I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. And I'd also like to especially welcome the many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander guests who are with us here today. Uh, welcome to the annual Hal Wooden Lecture, which first began in 2006 uh, in honour of our founding dean, Hal Wooden, who I'm delighted to say is again here tonight. And this is really the annual highlight of our lecture series. Our previous lecturers have come from close and far away, including people like Elizabeth Broderick, Brett Walker, Julian Burnside, uh, Sir Gerard Brennan, Martha Nussbaum, Albie Sachs, uh, Michael McHugh, Jose Ramos Horta, Hal Wooden himself. It's an august list of lecturers, uh, which really emphasises you know, the quality and the importance of this to the law school. These lectures also are quite distinctive from any others um, that we have. It's an opportunity for a speaker to talk about their life in the law and the potential for the law to be used as a lever to exact change, as something which can actually be quite instrumental in bringing about improved conditions for the community. And it's also an opportunity, should they so wish, to talk about the obligations and responsibilities of a lawyer and the sort of values and principles that should infuse the law as part of their own life's journey. The 2018 lecture, the one this year, is particularly special. Uh, this year marks a really important moment um, in the life of our law school. This year we will graduate our 100th Indigenous student. And it's been a long time coming, I would say. We're nearly 50 years old and uh, we're proud that we've got to 100 Indigenous students. But just as much as we're proud, um, equally we would say that's not enough. And we look forward to graduating many more and we look forward to accelerating the programs that we have for those students. This year is also very special because we mark the appointment of one of our own, uh, Professor Megan Davis, as Pro Vice-Chancellor Indigenous at UNSW, uh, a very important strategic appoint appointment that really emphasises the leadership that she and the Indigenous community is playing here at UNSW. Now, we're trying to mark um, these milestones and our 100th Indigenous graduate in lots of ways this year. And we're really trying to recognise and celebrate um, the many accomplishments and the Indigenous leaders in our midst and across the community. We held a big event three weeks ago, which was part of this series, at the Mason Conversation, which featured Megan Davis and Pat Anderson, uh, two really fine Indigenous women leaders who talked about their life's journey and how indeed they're shaping the law even today. And on that occasion, we were really pleased that just as you see tonight, we have the original Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, one of those foundational historic documents um, in Australia's journey to a more just society. And uh, we're very pleased, thank you, Megan, that you've again shared that with us tonight uh, on the stage. Now, the milestones that we're marking this year, particularly the journey for our students, are really significant given just how this law school has come to achieve those things. And these are things that Hal Wooden has been relating to me and as part of my own learning experience as Dean. And Hal's been explaining to me about just how this law school was created and the sort of vision that it, it had all those years ago. He's told me how the new law school was planned in 1970 and that occurred at the same time that a new debate was emerging in Australia. The ABC Boyer Lectures in 1968 had been delivered by the anthropologist W.E.H. Stanner on the topic of the Great Australian Silence. He argued that whole areas of Indigenous and non-Indigenous history, such as invasion, theft of land and massacres, had been long ignored by historians in Australia and elsewhere. And UNSW law was formed at the very time that we as a community started to grapple with that silence, to grapple with the recognition simply understanding our history and starting to understand the impact that that was having upon Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Because when it came to law schools in 1970, when we were being created, when it came to understanding the perspective of Indigenous peoples, it was pretty simple for learning law. You were taught, you were taught a Blackstone's law of settled colonies and of course Australia was a nation formed upon the basis of it being terra nullius, a nation that was uninhabited, a nation empty of people deserving recognition. So when we were formed, that was the mindset that uh, Hal and the team were determined to change. Early in 1970, when Hal was the only member of the law school, he started to give press interviews explaining how change needed to occur. He stressed the importance of producing lawyers sensitive to the needs of the whole of society, not just part, 
not just the powerful and not just the privileged. As a result of those interviews, he was approached soon afterwards on behalf of a group of young Aboriginal people in Redfern who were seeking ways to resist unfair and often illegal treatment of their community by the police. And that ultimately led to the first Aboriginal legal service, which in turn inspired the Aboriginal Medical Service and numerous other Aboriginal community organisations. And one thing that people may not know is until the Aboriginal Legal Service had its own premises, it was actually based here at UNSW Law, given our role in helping to found it. If you look also at the roles played by the first members of this faculty, they were deeply influenced by the world in which they were seeking to change. If you look at the first two, Richard Chisholm, a new junior appointment back in the early 1970s, he was someone who made an emergency appearance for the service's first client, a young Aboriginal girl, which then inspired his interest in family law and ultimately he became a judge of the family court. The other member of that time, the senior appointment, Garth Nettime, who sadly, sadly passed away earlier this year, became treasurer of the Aboriginal Legal Service. He developed a well-published background in Indigenous legal issues, served as an advisor to many First Nations people and their organisations, and helped to establish the Indigenous Law Centre here at UNSW Law. And when it came to the students in those first years, our first students in 1971 included two young Indigenous people who held office at the Aboriginal Legal Service. They were admitted to, as students under a university-wide program for the special admission of Aboriginal students, which was the first such program at any Australian university. Now, the calibre of these students and our Aboriginal students here from UNSW Law has been truly exceptional. And if you look down the long list of those students, it's something we're going to be celebrating soon with a major event to reconnect with and celebrate 100 Aboriginal alumni. They include people from the earliest years, such as Pat O'Shane, and, and her story is typical of many Aboriginal people. After graduating in 1976, she achieved a remarkable belate, but belated series of firsts, the first Indigenous barrister, the first Indigenous permanent head of a ministry, and the first Indigenous New South Wales magistrate. And I mention her just as one among many strong stories, you know, powerful examples of how these alumni are achieving remarkable things in our community. And indeed now amongst our 100 Aboriginal alumni, we have four judges. And uh, that again is a, a very powerful symbol of their achievement and as a role model for our students today. So given this history, given our own passion and connection for Indigenous justice as a community, it's really fitting today that the Hal Wharton Lecturer this year is an inspiring Indigenous leader. And I'm proud that that person is Noel Pearson, who's going to deliver the 12th Hal Wharton Lecture. Noel is from the Gugu Yuthmia community of Hope Vale on southeastern Cape York Peninsula. He's a lawyer and founder and director of strategy of the Cape York Partnership. Noel founded the Cape York Land Council and helped to establish a range of other organisations, including Health Council, Development Corporation, Indigenous Enterprise Partnerships. He's also served in a variety of capacities and had deep relationships with many of Australia's most influential leaders. And his service includes being a member of the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians and more recently, the Referendum Council. As with many of you, I suspect in this room, my earliest memories of Noel and his role in Australian public life go back a long way. I remember as a very young lawyer, fresh out of law school, uh, watching with you know, some awe his principled advocacy on behalf of his community in the wake of the Mabo case as he and other leaders fought to achieve a just settlement, a fight that continues to this very day. In the years since, uh, I, amongst others, have been deeply impressed by his thoughtful interventions on a range of public policy topics that inspire debate, interventions that are often deeply thought out and designed to reveal uncomfortable but necessary truths with which the community must grapple. So with that background, I'd like to say how we're delighted we are to welcome Noel, and if you can please welcome him to the lectern. Thank you, George, for that kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for uh, your presence here this evening. I am going to first give some acknowledgements to our First Nations of this place and to First Nations across the country who are with us here this evening. Um, 
I'm, it's of course my privilege to speak in honour of Hal, who has been a great friend of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations for many, many decades. I have a long association with Hal going back uh, probably more than 20 years. Hal and I worked on a project in Cape York Peninsula, trying to work out a retrospective settlement of issues that we had with a major mining company on the west coast of Cape York. I want to acknowledge the University of New South Wales Law School. I had inquired of Professor, the late Professor Netheim whether I would come to this school. And it's a, I, I ended up going to Sydney University Law School and spent a completely miserable, lonely time there. <laughs> and I regretted that I didn't take, take up Garth's invitation to come to this law school. Um, I suspect it's a source of some hesitation on the part of Sydney University Law School because I always recite this story. <laughs> I think I had one friend in all of my years there. I was chronically shy and uh, lacked a great deal of confidence. But nevertheless, um, I'm not here to really speak on behalf of any great legal knowledge this evening. Um, I'm going to talk about the politics of self-determination. And um, I just want to say that it, it was, of course, a uh, great sadness to hear of Garth's passing and his great spirit um, was one that I'd encountered again as a young man and uh, he was a great blessing to our people. Um, I'm also dismayed that Sir Anthony's not here this evening. He sent his apologies to me. I'm one of his uh, great fans. I think back on the Mason and Brennan courts as that era we had when kind of the West Indies reigned <laughs> in the late 70s and early 80s. You know, Sir Anthony was like Clive, Clyde Holding, and um, Sir William was like Vivian Richards, <laughs> and Sir Gerard was kind of the Gordon Greenwich of the side. The Australian Jurists have never been better than those two courts. I want to talk about how I view our challenge. And I go from the deepest depths of despair to some irrational hope about our prospects. And so I alighted upon this nostrum to lift me out of my gloom in relation to our challenge with constitutional reform and generally our place, our rightful place in this country. When I thought about the idea the other week that the way we should think about this is that um, we, when they have nothing to lose and we have everything to gain, I think that's the way we should think about it. When they have nothing to lose and when we have everything to gain. I am energised by this idea because that is the nature of our challenge. White Australians have got nothing to lose. They're not going to concede anything to us because they have nothing to lose. But we have to remember that we have everything to gain. If we think through our predicaments and we alight upon strategies and actions that ever seek a better place for our people in this, our own country. I think it's wrong for us to act as we too often do as if we're the ones with nothing to lose. Nay, 
we have everything to gain. And therefore, we have to be smarter. We have to be more convicted. We have got to be utterly hopeful of success. We can't let despair darken our horizons. We've got to be realistic. But we have everything to gain and there's every reason for us to face Everest with a determination that it requires, that it demands of us. Too often, struggles on behalf of the poor and wretched are struggles that are conducted as if we've got nothing to lose. I think that's the wrong mentality. The mentality we have to have is that we have everything to gain and our opponents have got nothing to lose. And that should mean that we've got to get them to understand that success for us does not mean they lose anything. They indeed can gain. At the moment, my assessment is that white Australia thinks they're going to lose everything if they concede to us. If they concede to a just settlement, something is going to be lost on their side of the ledger. And uh, that is a recipe for prolonging this torment of powerlessness for another 200 years, if we're not careful. So, I think with all of our setbacks and all of our disappointments, we have to look forward and we've got to keep our eyes on the prize for we have a world to gain. I'm partly here on advice from my friend and colleague, Professor Davis, that this is a hotbed of progressivism. <laughs> and I'd better start by explaining myself. <laughs> I feel like I've, I've turned up at the pigsty like the prodigal son and I've got some explaining to do. So let me try with this first orientation. This is the way I think about the world. Between the binary of the left and the right, I actually think the important orientations are conservatism, liberalism and socialism. And all societies have some kind of amalgam of the three. I don't come from any of these traditions. So I've been able to sus suspend my fierce tribal loyalty to any of these dispositions. It's been easy for me to understand that I am a conservative. How could I not be coming from a culture that's 60,000 millennia old? A strong conservative instinct towards the maintenance of ritual and tradition and the importance of structures of society and family and law could not but be my tradition. And of course my mission upbringing and membership of a religious community means that my predilections are, in some respects, highly conservative. Conservatism is the richness of societies. Conservatism preserves memory. They represent a respect for some of the most important things that explain great mysteries to human beings. So I don't abjure conservatism simply because political conservatism is distasteful. I understand the conservative's argument in relation to conservatism. 
and I appreciate much of it. Of course, socialism. Of course the socialists are right about the importance of regard for others and the importance of spreading opportunity across society and that life should not just be a question of preserving privilege. So I get the socialist argument. I think it's innate to human beings to have other regard, to have a moral sentiment in favour of others in society. But I also understand the Liberals' argument. I can't deny the fact that I too am motivated by a burning magnesium flame of self-interest in my breast. I am like everyone else. I have a jealous regard for my own first. My children today are my first consideration. And prospects for my family motivate me to seek a better life for them. This is a natural regard for my own. It becomes an engine of motivation to seek something better. And I notice everyone else has that same motivation too, including the socialists. The liberals are right. Self-interest is a great engine. It is a great engine for the good. Dare I say it to this audience. Adam Smith was right. Good things come when we pursue our own best interests. And I reflect upon this because daily I ask myself, how are the poor and wretched going to rise up in the world and take a better share of it? That's my question. How do the poorest get a better share of the privileges of this world and this country? And I can't deny the importance for progress of the liberal motivation to pursue one's own interests and that of your own family as a starting point. Self-interest is not selfishness. It is a natural human motivation for the good. So I am at one with the Liberals on that. But I seek the radical centre of these positions. I seek the right amalgam. I seek the right balance between a respect for conservatism an understanding of the importance of liberal self-interest and choice, but also never denying the importance of our social instincts and obligations. That's my first orientation. The second orientation I want to talk about is our right to take responsibility and self-determination. This was a pamphlet I published in 1999 when I began my post-land rights trajectory in Indigenous policy. And for me, my emphasis on responsibility uh, was explained in my treatise as follows. I wrote, my own perspective on the meaning of self-determination came from Lars Emil Johansson, the Indigenous Premier of Greenland, who addressed the Regional Agreements Conference organised by the Cape York Land Council in Cairns in July 1994. He explained self-determination is the right, self is the right to take responsibility Self-determination is hard work. 
This is a critical insight for those concerned with Aboriginal policy at the highest levels and at the grassroots. In claiming the right to self-determination, we are claiming the right to take responsibility. We need to restore the importance of responsibility in our understanding of our problems and in our understanding of the solutions, otherwise we are kidding ourselves and our people. Of course, it was at that point in my minor contribution to Indigenous policy thinking that I lost the progressive left. There was a completely allergic reaction to my discourse about responsibility. And my hope that people would understand my argument that at the heart of true self-determination lies an assumption of responsibility, unfortunately, did not take place. I did not succeed in widening an understanding that a responsibility agenda was an important agenda for our self-determination. But it is my abiding orientation. The next thing I want to talk about is the importance of both structure and agency. Of course, both dimensions determine our prospects. We are captured by structures and our prospects are influenced by structures but we also have human agency. Not everything is about structures as much as these structures represent real limitations on our capacity for agency. It is a struggle. These structures are, of course, institutional and governmental. And until we reform many of the institutional and governmental structures that affect our prospects as indigenous peoples, we reform them, we're going to struggle to make progress. We will never close the gap unless there is structural reform. But these structures are, of course, not just institutional and governmental, they're cultural. They're ideological, they're psychological, and the entire superstructure that affects the lives of individuals, individual human beings, their families and communities, these structures are sometimes so overwhelming and impossible to conceive of reforming even though they work such harm to people. We have structures of education that routinely deliver to Aboriginal children in remote communities absolute certainty that 25% of them will never learn to read these structures of education, institutions representing teachers, government departments representing school delivery, ministerial and governmental structures that are supposed to fulfill the rhetoric that every child deserves a good education, nevertheless routinely deliver to Aboriginal children an absolute certainty 25% of them will never learn to read and will therefore end up in jail. Another 50% will read poorly and 25% may gain some rudiment of literacy. How do you turn these structures that do such harm 
around. When the poor and the migrant and the Aboriginal and the South Pacific Islander and the Africans receive such poor education. These structures are hard to change. I work in the stony fields of Indigenous education. I work almost on a daily basis in those fields. And I can tell you, It is completely perverse, the structural forces that condemn tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of the country's most disadvantaged black, white, yellow children, condemns them to lives of underachievement and failure. How do you turn it around? Those are the structures, but a human agency can turn structures around. Many of these structures are underpinned by law and public law reform initiatives can change these structures for the better. Law reform has a role in reforming structures. And human beings, at the end of the day, are capable of reforming structures and making them less harmful and more enabling of human flourishing. I say to my young leaders in Cape York, I think the way to understand the different contributions of agency and structure to the prospects of human progress is to say that 51% lies with agency and 49% with structures. We've got to believe that. We have to believe that concerted human determination to reform structures and to prevail over the limitations of structures will enable us to make progress. It's an optimistic calculation, but at the end of the day, we have to believe that with concerted action, real human beings can have the agency to prevail over structural impediments. The next orientation I have is about human rights and the whole question of public law versus social and economic development. When I began my reform work in Cape York Peninsula, I was skeptical of how far the public law of human rights would take us. I was more interested in social and economic development. I wanted human rights to materialise in reality. I wasn't interested in human rights fiat. I wanted the human rights of the child to be reflected in a good bed to sleep at night. Freedom from violence the opportunity to go to a good school, the opportunity to go to university, the opportunity to get a job and to participate in the economy and take a fair share of the country. I was always skeptical about the limits of public law to deliver these changes. Of course we needed law to remove impediments and to create enabling institutions and opportunities and to reform structures, but by themselves, they weren't gonna give a hungry child a full belly. 
That required social and economic action. And yet I reflected upon the fact that too much of the discourse of human rights seemed to leave things at the point at which the fiat was accomplished. Once the fiat was issued, somehow it was going to materialise in a better life. And it doesn't work like that. Lawyers seem not to understand this. Lawyers seem to think that if you get the fiat right, the society will change for the better. Fiat is only part of it. There's got to be real social and economic action. I want to know when the rights of the child are enjoyed by the child. I want to know when the rights of the women are enjoyed by the women and what practical action do we need to take so that they enjoy it? Not in 10 years' time or 50, but tomorrow night. So, that's my other orientation. My fifth orientation is the meaning of social justice and the radical centre. And politicians and political parties of the left routinely talk about social justice and in my view, they don't know what it is. We harbour this idea that social justice is some kind of ephemeral thing. You know, that would only come about if only we had a better leader and a more a less gutless government, the right kind of prime minister or the right kind of political leadership will somehow result in social justice. This idea that there's some kind of major forklift that can be stuck into the Australian population at the bottom to lift the wretched off the floor. Yeah? I always ask myself, what is the machine of social justice that we always talk about? When I hear a politician of the left talk about social justice, I wonder what is meant. Because the only way I see progress happening in nations and societies across the world is when mum and dad clutch their children to their breasts, motivated by their own self-interest, to climb a few rungs to put themselves in a better position. What societies have advanced throughout the 20th century absent that formula? So in Cape York Peninsula, we had a major rethink. We asked ourselves, how is it that the disadvantaged and the excluded and the poor and the poverty-stricken, how do they advance in the world? And so our staircase mo metaphor for society came into being. A staircase has foundations, strong foundations. And those foundations of social and cultural norms that keep families and communities in a good position, even poor ones, even poor ones, are served well by strong foundations of social and cultural norms that prioritise the formative development of their youth. They're really important. Those norms explain why Asian Americans and Asian Australians do so well, notwithstanding their backgrounds of poverty and mean opportunity. Strong foundations where parental responsibility 
important family obligation, a premium. The second part of our staircase metaphor concerned the underpinnings of the staircase, the infrastructure, what Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, called capabilities, strong capabilities, good health, good education, good infrastructure, freedoms, all of the things that humans need to flourish. The underpinnings of the staircase are social redistribution of opportunity and the building of capabilities. And finally, the third part of our metaphor is that real human beings have got to climb stairs. There is no magical forklift that can lift entire communities to a better life. Yes, we can mobilise major government provisioning and redistribution for capabilities, but at the end of the day, it is real human beings climbing to a better life, clutching their children to their breasts and jealously wishing for them a better future. That's how progress takes place. That's how development happens. And so for me, the eureka moment was to understand that there, it was completely an illusion that somehow some great leftist leader was going to one day command the great big diesel engine of the forklift to lift our people to a better life. It's never going to happen. It's an illusion. The illusion of social justice. What is real social justice is when people climb to a better life with their own legs, in pursuit of their own interest. And yet we tell the poor, self-interest is not for you. Jealous regard for your children is not for you. It is for my children, but not for you. More material prospects, better earning opportunities, that's not for poor people. Poor people deserve our charity. Poor people deserve a handout. There's something dirty about self-interest. What kind of poverty program do we run in our modern Australian society that is predicated on the idea that the poor are just like us? They want better things for their children too. They want better material lives. That's my orientation. Social justice is merely the sum total of a whole lot of individual progress. And of course we need large redistribution to build capabilities and provide opportunity. But we get the whole question of justice wrong if we predicate all of that on the basis of charity and handout rather than motivating the natural interest that people have in pursuing better lives. The Labor Party does not understand this. How can you be a party of social attack if you don't understand that the engine of change is the magnesium flame of desire? desire for something better. Social justice is the sum total of a whole lot of individual progress supported by redistribution. My next orientation, and I have to say this is the one that I have not broken through in relation to my own thinking. 
and I get defeated every time I try to think about it. But it is the problem of oppression. I don't want to be negative about this because we have to think our way past this problem for the wretched. But we are in a massive trap. We are in a massive trap of race, class and gender. And every time we try to make progress, the left support us on something and the right oppose us on something. And, then, and when we try to make progress on the other front, the right support us on that and the left bitterly oppose us. We'll, it's like we can't win. We have enemies on both sides restraining our progress and abjuring the idea that perhaps sometimes these contrary ideas are both necessary. I work in stony fields. I try to thread our way through the thicket of these impediments, these ideological impediments. Most of the impediments for our reform work in Cape York Peninsula is not locally inspired. Most of our impediments come from the outside, from the wider ideological and cultural discourse in the wider Australian community. And our people get terribly divided and confused about what it is that we need to do in order to make progress because we're located in a much larger storm about these things than our own community. And so it seems that every time we make progress, large currents and forces come to bear based on illegitimate ideas of race, the forces of class, and of course, the particular impediments faced by women. So my little table there, this skewed pyramid, of course, my little table there says that white men, many of them experience class oppression, but they know nothing of race and gender oppression. White women experience class and gender oppression, but not race oppression. Black men appear, experience class and race oppression, but not gender oppression. And of course, black women experience all three. My next orientation is progressivism ideology, and my most important idea I take from Karl Marx is the camera obscura. That is, that the world appears upside down. Black is white, red is blue, north is south. And this is quotation from the German ideology is, 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 I think, Marx's most important observation about the way forces of class play out in society. If in all ideology men and their circumstances appear upside down, as in a camera obscura, this phenomenon arises just as much from their historical life process as the inversion of objects on the retina does from their physical life process. My own humble version of that insight was in a lecture I gave in the year 2000 for the Light on the Hill oration at Bathurst. And I wrote in that lecture that a rule of thumb in relation to most of the programs and policies 
that pose as progressive thinking in Indigenous affairs is that if we did the opposite, we would have a chance of making progress. This is because the subservience of our intellectual culture to the cause of class prejudice and stratification is so profound and universal. What we believe is forward progress is in fact standing still or actually moving backwards. So that's my rule of thumb I say to our mob in the Cape. Whatever the progressives say we should do, let's try to do something approximately the opposite. <laughs> and that has not endeared me to progressives. <laughs> But it is remarkable, and I, I say this in absolute seriousness, it is remarkable how, how often that rule of thumb works out. When you logically suspend yourself from the kind of subjective analysis of a policy to an objective appreciation of, well, what does that produce? Um, I, I, I'm grieving over a school I lost thanks to the ABC three years ago. Grieving. And, um, of course, the school has gone to the dogs now that the department's taken, out, taken that school back. And, of course, the Premier that intervened said that she wanted the school to be just like any other Queensland school, which is what I feared. <laughs> but even then, the school is now, um, uh, the, the ABC story of two days ago was about, it, they have flexible learning. They have a flexible learning model where you can turn up at the PCYC and undertake some activity Blah, blah, blah. You know, none of us would send our children to a fle flexible learning school. None of the people teaching that program, none of the politicians who've sanctioned that program would ever send their children to a flexible learning school. But the kids at Oracle apparently deserve that. Marx would say to us, if we're truly from the left, it can't just be a subjective thing. We've got to take an objective view about what's happening. What is really happening here? Let me now get to strategy. My first strategy is the radical strategy versus radical chic in the age of Twitter. It's my big quarrel with the indigenous rights movement. We're too prone to radical chic, as if, as if Tom Wolfe never wrote about it 50 years ago. And uh, of course, the modern Aboriginal advocacy movement thinks that all you have to do is tweet. The praxis of political activism and advocacy has given way to social media. And I ask myself, well, who is fighting to get the next 100 hectares of land back? Who is actually fighting Rio Tinto or BHP for justice? Who is fighting a government that wants to strip Aboriginal native title of any commercial development? Who is fighting the Palaszczuk government when they want to subject all Aboriginal lands to environmental lockup. 
there's livelihood and economy at stake. There's an agenda of getting out of poverty at stake. There's an agenda for employment at stake. But who's fighting the Greens? Who's fighting the Wilderness Society? Who's fighting the Australian Conservation Foundation to preserve Paul Keating's achievement of the Native Title Act? Nobody wants to join us in that fight. We must be on the wrong side of it. Everybody who should understand the true meaning of land rights, which is that the traditional owners should finally have a say over what happens on their own land. Principle number one of land rights. And yet we've allowed that to fall away so that Labor governments in Brisbane can get elected on them in a city vote. And our land rights are sold out to the politics in George Street. And Labor get offended when we point that out. When we point out the fact that Native Title and Mabo and the Native Title Act was supposed to be a Labor achievement. Since when has land rights only meant that we should say no to everything? And of course, it is the milieu in which modern Aboriginal activism, social media activism, is located. Nobody wants to be seen to be at odds with the Greens. No black fellow wants to distance themselves from the progressive milieu in which they work and live and study. Nobody wants to be put through that discomfort. But if you want to protect Aboriginal land rights in 2018, if you're a black fella and you want to take true radical action to preserve the principle of land rights, then you're going to have to think seriously about saying to the Greens, we have a right to say yes and no. That's the meaning of land rights. We say, what is the difference between Rio Tinto, or Conzinc Rio Tinto as it was, manipulating traditional owner groups 30 years ago, 50 years ago, what is the difference between Greens today doing the same thing? Busting up families and communities in pursuit of their agendas. So, if we want a real radical strategy, we've got to wake up to the fact that it can't be all chic. The next strategy is the 90% versus 51% strategy that I want to talk about. Obviously, some of our challenges require us to persuade 51% of the parliament or those in government to run in favour of our agenda. And but some of our challenges, such as constitutional reform, require a 90% strategy. We've got to enjoin the entire Australian community in favour of constitutional reform. A majority of voters in a majority of the states. And each of those challenges require different strategies. We can't just pursue constitutional reform with a 51% headset. We'll get nowhere. If we want constitutional reform with a majority of voters in a majority of the states, we've got to have a strategy to get 90% of the country on board. It can't be a partisan 
push from the left. The Native Title Act was a 51% victory, but constitutional recognition is a completely different challenge. Some poor bastard has got to go to four o'clock on the clock and hunt. And my complaint is that everybody wants to hunt at 7 a.m. at the Glebe Town Hall or wherever. That's easy. You got to go out to Roma. You got to go out to Musgrave. And you got to go to where the National Party and the Liberal constituencies live if we're going to have a 90% of Australians joining our cause. So, we woke up to the fact that some of us are got to hunt at four o'clock and we can't all be gathered around on the left side of the clock. Related to that principle, of course, is that you need Nixon to go to China. And I've gone, I've played a long game in relation to this, and I've come upon bitter, bitter disappointment. But I still hold that the principle is still decisive. The principle is still decisive. You still need Nixon to go to China. You need decent conservatives and liberals to embrace the cause. And our long game with the conservatives proved was smashed on the shores of Malcolm Turnbull's prime ministership and his weakness. I went to see him in 2015 with a colleague of mine when he was Minister for Communications. And I put to him that an alternative for constitutional recognition would be some kind of representative body enshrined in the Constitution. And he said to me, that sounds like a sensible idea. But when the Referendum Council reported, and it was politically, he was being politically stalked by his predecessor, all of a sudden he'd forgotten about his commitment. But I can swear on my parents' grave that he had told me that it was a sensible idea. But that liar then turned coat. And all of that rhetoric about a third chamber of parliament and an affront to the principle of equality came gushing out of you know, has there been a worse Prime Minister since Billy McMahon than, the How than Turnbull? Next strategy. Voice, then treaty, and truth. First precondition to a treaty is for us to have a voice, and the voice to negotiate such a treaty. It's common sense. We talked about it in the dialogues that Professor Davis and Pat Anderson chaired in 2016. Every blackfellow understood this. Every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander delegate to the dialogues of 2016 understood that there's a sequence here. We get the voice enshrined and then we move to a treaty negotiation and truth-telling. That was an important part of the strategy. 
We also got to come to strategically to grips with this question of reconciliation versus reconciliation action plans. You know, blackfellas have got to wake up. We can't keep giving away to emotion. We can't keep giving away, giving way to cheap sentiment. This is highly serious business. So in 2008, we allowed the country to say sorry to us and we deferred the question of reparation. And yet when White Australia went through its grievances about institutional abuse, they got reparations. How smart are we? We let the country get away with it. Because we wanted to give way to sentiment before hard-headed strategy. We should have extracted out of the Rudd government a proper scheme for reparations rather than simply accepting the words, as important as those words were. The struggle we've had in the past two years has been a struggle between recognition versus minimalism. Both of the major parties were prejudiced towards minimalism and without our advocacy, Labor would not have turned around. Labor had a minimalist disposition. They would have cut a deal on minimalism with Turnbull had there not been indigenous objection. Minimalism is the, it's raising its ugly head again. Some kind of idea that some lame preambular statement combined with the removal of the word race and its replacement with either nothing or with the words indigenous or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander would somehow be something substantive. We objected to minimalism. When it came to same-sex marriage, though, voices in favour of minimalism were shouted down. Nobody would have accepted anything other than full marriage. And yet when it came to our business, we were being told that we should accept some kind of minimalist outcome, not full recognition. And there's a lot of talk about treaty around the countryside. Every other state government and territory governments using the word. But somewhat as antipathetic to our cause and our people as Gary Johns could see the light that we couldn't when he described one of the state's so-called treaty negotiations as essentially being about service delivery. Johns could see plainly what we could not. Treaty's got to be more, got to be about more than simply service delivery. I fear, as the opportunity arises for us after we've done the voice and get into treaty discussions, that those who easily use the word treaty are talking about some PAP concerning service delivery. Strategy number six, the first question for a national treaty. There are provincial processes going on, one of which has been shut down quite correctly in South Australia. I beg forgiveness for making a commentary about a jurisdiction that I'm not part of, but I think Premier Marshall was completely correct when he described those negotiations as gesture politics. 
every other Labor jurisdiction is engaged in gesture part politics concerning treaties. They're using the word in completely insincere terms. Because the first question for a national treaty is whether we want to have treaties at the state and territory level, or whether we want an exclusive jurisdiction with the Commonwealth. That's the first question for a treaty. Should Indigenous affairs be an exclusive Commonwealth jurisdiction? We've got to answer that question first before we get misled by the Palaszczuk government or the Gunner government in relation to their so-called cheap treaty processes. Of course, the Uluru Statement from the Heart sets our agenda out and it really was a magnificent achievement by Megan and Pat Anderson and the team from the University of New South Wales. They really carried that whole process. Megan designed a brilliant method for regional dialogues. I only attended a minority of the dialogues around the countryside. The sheer weight of that process was carried by Megan and Pat Anderson and the team from the University of New South Wales that supported her in which I believe was the high water mark of self-determination, no less. And that's the thing that distresses me the most. The fact that we don't recognise what an achievement in self-determination Uluru was. An extraordinary process of dialogue, debate, discussion, hard-headed thinking about policy, legal and strategic issues and hard-headed choices being made about which direction we should pursue. Complete attention to the realities, but at the same time, maintaining an ideal for a better future. And that statement there is the product of that process. And in my view, if that is not self-determination, then what is? What is Indigenous self-determination if not that? There was no more a rigorous process than that which was undertaken. And yes, there was argument and debate and difference of point of view, but the level of consensus that was achieved through that process and the hope that was invested in that outcome was truly remarkable. Of course, that weekend following the 26th of May 2016 was completely disappointing. The response of the politicians from both sides of the aisle, if you go back and look at the record of media responses that weekend and in the days following, was disheartening. After all all of that long six-month process of work, there was a, um, both um, a, a really mealy-mouthed response, even from our Indigenous politicians, to the outcome at Uru. And of course, when I look back of the history of events that followed Uluru, it is a classic case of progressives and leftists not understanding that if we're to seize the opportunity of a once in a lifetime's opportunity to achieve justice, we have got to be a bit more disciplined. We've got a bit more serious. This wasn't a game that was played out at Uluru. This was deadly serious business. 
and the mealy-mouthed response of the politicians in the days following did us great harm. And of course, many, many organisations have come in behind us, right across the country. Professor Greg Craven said, this is an idea that grows over time. Most ideas die a slow death. But this is an idea, Uluru is an idea that is growing over time. But some of the organisations that should have got in behind us forthwith didn't. They stuffed around, they took time. They didn't contribute to the political momentum that we needed. The Law Council didn't publicise their support for the Uluru Statement until the day after Cabinet rejected it, three months later. How was that going to contribute? to a proper outcome from Cabinet and the Turnbull government if one of our strongest supporters doesn't make its position known for three months. The Australian Council of Trade Unions was no better. The Maritime Union of Australia were in with us from the beginning. But the ACTU can't bring itself to even utter the word Uluru. and only recently, in a mealy-mouthed way, endorsed it, long after the AMA had. We had two ducks in a row in the middle of last year. We had Uluru in May, and then we had the Referendum Council's report at the end of June and those ducks were in complete alignment. And what we didn't have was the party of the political left lined up as a third duck behind our position. It was wobbling. It wanted to talk about amending race clauses. It wanted to talk about the need for a preambular provision. It wanted to talk about resuscitating a prohibition against racial discrimination. Even though the Blackfellas had debated the prohibition against racial discrimination up hill and down dale, and chosen the voice. No, there had to be a wobble. The third duck was not in alignment. And how were we going to prevail with all of the challenges we had to try and get the Liberals and the Conservatives behind Uluru when supposedly the sympathetic political party was on a wobble? In my view, those who quibbled with Uluru without accepting the act of self-determination that it represented did us an injustice. They did us great harm. Finally, the agency of empowerment, as well as structural reform, we have got to understand that we ourselves have got to save ourselves. Whitefellas, and you know that Kevin Gilbert book, and it was never more truer when he said, because the white man will never do it. You know, we've got to do it ourselves. We've got to have agency. And a big part of our empowerment is about our agency in pursuit of our own destiny. And of course... We want the country to embrace our culture. It is a gift to the country. That is what the Uluru Statement says. We have a culture that should be owned by the Australian people. 
Finally, I want to do a very immodest thing, which is um, as if the whole thing wasn't immodest, but anyway. <laughs> Let me. The Referendum Council uh, proposed a declaration be developed outside of the Constitution, simply as a declaration. And that it have no legal footing, but it would declare something about Australia and something about recognition that was inclusive of everybody. And um, so I, I have decided to kick the ball off in proposing my own words on a declaration of Australia, with which I'll close my lecture. So, whereas three stories make Australia, the ancient indigenous heritage, which is its foundation, the British institutions built upon it, and the adorning gift of multicultural migration. And whereas Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the First Nations of the Australian continent and its islands, possessed under ancient laws and customs, according to the reckoning of culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science for more than 65 millennia. This is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with their ancestors. We recognize and honor the First Nations who discovered Australia as their sovereign possession, the oldest continuing civilization in the world. And whereas those who sailed the first fleet landing at Sydney Cove carried upon their shoulders the common law of England when the sovereignty of the British crown was proclaimed, the rule of law, parliamentary government and the Australian English language have their provenance in Britain. From eyes on board ship, this was a settlement. And from eyes on shore, an invasion. We recognise the eve of the 25th and the dawn of the 26th January 1788 as a profound time for all of us. When ancient Australia became the new Australia. We recognise and honour the Britons and Irish, convict and free, who founded our institutional heritage, making our Commonwealth from 1901 a great democracy of the globe. And whereas peoples the earth over brought their multitude of cultural gifts to Australia. That we celebrate diversity and unity makes us a beacon unto the world. We recognise and honour our new Australians. When we renounced the white Australia policy, we made a better Commonwealth. We show that people with different roots can live together that we can learn to read the image bank of others, that we can look across the frontiers of our differences without prejudice or illusion. Because interesting th things happen at the interface between cultures. Now therefore, with earnest and open hearts, and strong desire to fill the lacuna. After more than two centuries, we make this declaration of Australia and the Australian people
to see our reflections in each other and recognise one and all. Our history is replete with shame and pride, failure and achievement, fear and love, cruelty and kindness, conflict and comity, mistake and brilliance, folly and glory. We will not shy from its truth. Our storylines entwine further each generation. We will ever strive to leave our country better for our children. We will honour the Uluru Statement from the heart and make good upon it. Whilst English is the shared language of our Commonwealth, mother tongues name the country and sing its songlines, and we do not want for them to pass from this land. They are part of the cultural and natural wonder of our country, that is the campfire of our national soul, and the pledge of care and custody we owe our ancestral dead and unborn descendants. After the battles of our frontier wars fell silent, diggers from the First Nations joined their settler and new Australian comrades in the crucibles of Gallipoli and Kokoda and there distilled the essence of our values. That our mateship is and will always be our enduring bond that freedom and the fair go are our abiding ethic, that our virtues of egality and irreverence give us courage to have a go, that we know we can and always will count on each other. Three stories make us one, Australians. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. I'd like now to ask uh, Megan Davis, who would like to say a few concluding words, and then Sean Brennan, who will provide a vote of thanks on behalf of Hal Wooden. Megan. Greetings, progressives. <laughs> thanks for that, Noel. <laughs> Dumping me in there. Um, I'll be very quick because Sean is actually giving the official... Um, Vote of thanks, I'm more of an imposter, and I'll only speak for a couple of minutes. I just thought that it might be appropriate to say something, given that I've worked with Noel now for, um, you know, almost 10 years on constitutional recognition, and um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart is the culmination of much of that, of, of that work. Um, and I also knew that there would be many UNSW law students and Aboriginal students in the audience and I wanted to uh, convey to them uh, how proud they should be of this law school and the contribution that this law school made um, to the work of the Referendum Council and uh, the, the reforms that came out of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, but what I wanted to do was just um, pay tribute and all but um, convey to the students in the audience some of the lessons, the really important lessons about the law that I learned working with him. Before I do so, I just wanted to point out the team that he referred to um, that are in the audience, as far as I know, who worked on um, the Referendum Council's dialogue process and the National Constitutional Convention at Uluru, Gabriel Appleby, 
I don't know, you should stand, Gabriel. Um, Sean Brennan, who's here in the front, and um, Gemma McKinnon. <laughs> oh, for their extraordinary work. Um, and particularly proud of Gemma McKinnon, a young Barkindji Aboriginal woman from Wilcannia, a young Aboriginal lawyer who um, um, came along this journey um, with us. Um, when I, I, I started at UNSW uh, with George Williams, I was his first employee of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law um, as the Bill of Rights Director. Um, not many know, but I disappeared for a couple of years after working, well, not because it was terrible working with you, George, but um, <laughs> I went to, <laughs> to work elsewhere for a little bit um, uh, in a, at another university. And at that time, Noel was very uh, prolific in, in his writings around um, welfare reform, but also um, actual reform. Um, and in this unit that I worked in, uh, we spent a lot of time critiquing Noel Pearson, as he knows. Um, and I remember one day reading something he wrote in The Australian, where he said that it's okay for you to critique me, write whatever you want about me, but what, what are your ideas? What are your ideas for reform? What change do you want to bring? And I remember that having such a profound impact upon my thinking, um, that not long after I applied under David Dixon, I'm not sure where he is, um, David Dixon I pay tribute to because my work in relation to not just the UN but the expert panel and the referendum council was not possible without him. Um, I, I applied for the Indigenous Law Centre and came back here and decided that it was time that I subjected my thinking and my writing and my ideas to more robust critique but that I needed to think of ideas for reform because it's true, we were reactionary, we were writing op-eds about Noel, but I actually had no ideas. Um, but it was good timing because Hilary Charlesworth had had a short conversation with me and said, I'm going to, you know, you should really not do a PhD unless you're serious about it because I'd taken a long time to settle down. But this um, Noel's op-ed and that conversation with Hilary really energised and renewed my interest in reform. And law reform is really difficult, and I think um, Noel very eloquently spoke about that and the challenges of law reform in this country in his um, address tonight. Um, and I wanted to say a few things that I've learnt then about law reform along the way. One of the things I've learnt in working with Noel is strategy in law reform. This is something they don't teach you um, so much at law school. So while it was great to go away and work on my thesis and write lots of articles about ideas for reform and constitutional reform, I then discovered the next stage was it's not just about good ideas <laughs> and it's not just about theory, but how do you actually get there? And political strategy matters. Strategy really matters. And that was something that I um, have learnt working with, with Noel. The next thing that I would say to students is it's really, really hard work. He's right about Twitter. I didn't... A few people looked at me during that speech, but, I mean, yes, I tweet, but I also did all three. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> it is hard work. It is all your weekends, most of your nights, as James knows, constantly on the phone and a lot of reading, a lot of reading, a lot of analysis. And not just legal texts, but a lot of literature and other, and I mean literature, literature, and other um, genres of reading. There are so many different areas um, and different disciplines that you delve in when you're trying to push forward reform. The next thing I wanted to convey was this notion of orthodoxy. One of the most important things about Uluru was the rejection of orthodoxy. And I think Noel conveyed that very well um, tonight. What we did at Uluru was against the orthodox position of both sides of politics that recognition would be minimalism. That recognition would be deletion of Section 25, amendment to the race power, um, that it would be a statement of recognition. And, and that's what we fought against. And that's a really important thing in terms of law reform and as a law student, you must always, always think about what is the orthodoxy 
and are we really, should we really take that route? And I, I really, um, Noel's um, uh, Marxian <laughs> critique re resonated with me. Um, what we believe is forward um, or progressive is in fact um, standing still. And what we decided in the dialogues was that the orthodoxy of recognition was in fact the status quo. And I suppose the last thing I wanted to talk about is hope. Um, because Noel started from the outset in referring to the despair of our community. We do a lot of work around reform, a lot of work in terms of change in our community, and it's always rejected by people who know better, people who think they know better, people who think they can decide for us and think for us, people who, as Noel referred to in terms of self-determination, think they know what our future should be. And I never really thought it, um, I suppose, at the time when we were fighting post-expert panel and then we got the referendum council up, that, that Uluru is in fact a statement, a statement of hope. And I'll finish here, Sean, because I'm sure Sean's like, she's got a book. Now she's going to start reading. <laughs> <laughs> and I am. Um, but I used to quote an Old Testament scholar a lot in that dark period <laughs> between the expert panel and the referendum council about this notion of hope. And, and Uluru really, at the crux of it, um, I think, as I said, is about hope what a commission it is to express um, a future that none think is imaginable. And I think that is what we did at Uluru. I used to quote this all the time in those despairing and dark moments, but now I realise they apply to Uluru. Hope, on the other hand, is an absurdity too embarrassing to speak about, for it flies in the face of all those claims we are told are facts. Hope is the refusal to accept the reading of reality which is the majority opinion, and one does that only at great political and existential risk. On the other hand, hope is subversive, for, it's, uh, for it limits the grandiose pretension of the present, daring to announce that the present to which we all made commitments is now called into question. And this is the Uluru statement from the heart. The final comment I wanted to make in relation to my brother Noel, who um, Arnie Pat sends um, her apologies that she couldn't be here tonight, is that um, Uluru, he's very modest when he says he didn't attend. He, he attended most of the dialogues in, in addition to leading the design of the dialogues. Um, what I really learned in working with him uh, was his respect for, 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 for women, and female leadership. And I think the combination of Arnie Pat and Noel and I working together um, really, I think, led to, um, well, successful dialogues and the outcome at Uluru. But, but I will say, as Noel knows, it, it wasn't difficult. We're not going to be Pollyannas about it. It was challenging. It was difficult. You have to be flexible and not rigid. Your ideas are contested all the time. There's a lot of pushback. Sometimes it'd be me and Annie Pat. Sometimes it'd be Noel and Annie Pat. Um, the, it, it was a very, very complex um, relationship that led to this really marvellous outcome um, at Uluru. And I think the success of Uluru was because we respected each other. Um, we weren't too thin-skinned about the conversations, the difficult conversations we had to have. But I'm really grateful. Um, they often say Aboriginal politics is, is really, really dirty, but we know that's that, you know, after Morrison and Turnbull, we know that um, um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna take that anymore from white fellas. Um, um, it was a really marvelous experience working with you and thank you for delivering the speech tonight. Thanks, Megan, for the power of your insights. I have a more formal role and I will be brief. Um, Hal Wooten 
has asked me to respond to Noel's address with the vote of thanks. And I can't hope to match the eloquence and perspective that Hal would bring to that task, but I am honoured to be asked. The challenge of the Hal Wooten lecture is for an individual to reflect uh, personally on their life in the law, the very challenges and opportunities it provides, the values and the social meanings to be found in the law, and importantly, its connection with the history of the times. Um, Noel has well and truly delivered on Howe's vision of the lecture tonight in a characteristically robust and emphatic way. Noel's always had broad and eclectic interests that travel well beyond the law, um, notably into history, literature, music, and the life lessons to be drawn from the words and deeds of rugby god and Wallabies captain Mark Eller. Uh, ever since he played an instrumental role, fresh from Sydney Law School, in the formation of the Cape York Land Council, with the traditional owners of that region almost 30 years ago, Noel's career has been a constant, feisty wrestling match with the possibilities and the limitations of legislation, litigation, case law, and the Constitution, as well as the structural forces, as we heard tonight, of government, policy, and economy, always in the context of politics. Through that work, he's exerted a very significant personal influence over the course of events in Indigenous affairs, in his region of Cape York, in his home state of Queensland, and across the, across the nation. Tonight, we saw part of the explanation for that impact upon public affairs. It has been achieved off the back of intellectual curiosity, deep reading and reflection. It's been tested against the tough daily realities of life for Aboriginal people in this country and against the constraints that apply in practical politics. And as we also saw tonight, that intellectual command is matched by a powerful and arresting gift for the delivery of, uh, for the spoken delivery of the written and unwritten word. That choice to engage with the possibilities of reform, which pays due regard to, the prag to, to both pragmatism and principle, has situated him in a continuous battle because of the country we live in. Uh, that includes a battle with the limited intellectual bandwidth, the limited attention span, and sadly it has to be said in many respects, the limited care factor of many politicians and many in the media when it comes to detail in Aboriginal affairs. He's been fearless and often combative, taking on, as we heard tonight, both the left and the right. But another real feature of Noel's contribution is his insistence on engagement. Engagement in the face of accepted political realities. Pragmatically testing the possibilities of successful engagement with both sides of politics when they are the government in power is on his account a responsibility of leadership if people want to see change come to fruition. And he's always practised that approach knowing that defending a measured compromise can be a more difficult road to travel than maintaining purity in political defeat. In his approach to law, politics and reform, Noel's been intellectually and politically eclectic and one of the noticeable uh, things is the very broad spectrum of political influences he draws on and political partnerships he seeks to make. His appreciation of Whitlam-esque vision and achievement, or Keating-esque agenda, style and political skills are well known. They sit alongside expressed respect for liberal politicians across the spectrum of a broad church, from in certain dimensions, John Howard, to Fred Cheney and Peter Bohm. He's written eloquently about the humane political wisdom of Mabo lawyer, the late Ron Caston. The earthy and idiosyncratic sense of justice he's found among some National Party figures. 
and his admiration for the steel, grace and courage of Loacher O'Donoghue, whom he called the greatest Indigenous leader of the modern era. He has paid strong public tribute, as he did again tonight, to the heroic leadership of the regional dialogue process by Pat Anderson and Megan Davis that culminated in the Uluru Statement. Throughout his career in life in the law and politics, Knowles offered challenging ideas on history, land rights, racism and genocide, school education, alcohol regulation, welfare dependency, economic development and constitutional reform. And he's forced us to reckon with them and the strategy, strategies proposed to deal with them, as Megan emphasised. When read in the long form original, it is clear they come from long reflection on family and community experience, reading, thinking, intellectual engagement and a restless intellect. Tonight, he has forced us again to reckon with what surely must be one of the most pressing questions for people and politicians in Australia and for anyone interested in the possibilities offered by the law and legal reform. The strategy and politics of First Nations people achieving self-determination in Australia. Once more, he's focused our minds, as we speak of law reform, on the importance of strategic thinking, smart politics, and engagement across a broad political spectrum of thought, on the importance of ideas and of weighty words. He's provoked us and challenged us. He asks us to disturb and question settled assumptions. And he's left us with a declaration of Australia and the Australian people. There is indeed much there to think on in Noel's address tonight. Before I hand back to George to close, I'd like to present a small gift to Noel in acknowledgement of our appreciation for his presence here tonight and his delivery of the lecture. And with those thanks from you, I hand back to George to close the event. Thanks. Sean, Megan, and most of all, Noel, thank you for a really special night, uh, this 12th Hal Wooten Lecture, a really fitting tribute to the sort of work that is happening um, today to achieve justice and real change in this area. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, for such a great turnout tonight. I'll close now by saying that if you'd like to come and have a look at the statement, please come and do so. And thank you again for joining us.